Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, after a 24-hour odyssey from New York. I'm I'm relieved to be here in northern Minnesota. <laughs> um, and. Uh, and, and thanks to Jeremy for that, uh, a, a man, by the way, who single-handedly began the process that left Eric Prince of Blackwater in flight for Abu Dhabi. There's, there's really no way to thank Patrick Lannan and Lannan Foundation for their support of Tom Dispatch over these years and for having me here. I mean, except to say the obvious, which is thank you, heartfelt. And the same for Anthony Arnov of Haymarket Books. He's my editor as well as publisher, and as someone who has spent close to 40 years as a professional editor, I know a good one when I run across one. It's probably no mistake, by the way, that I became an editor and have remained so these last 40 years. I prefer being behind the scenes. It comes naturally to me. It's where I feel most comfortable accessing my brain, not, I assure you, out here in front of all of you. Nonetheless, here I am, and I'm gonna read you three pieces tonight all evidence of a late-in-life late adventure I stumbled into, which is my website, tomdispatch.com. Pieces at the site generally reflect my particular obsessions, especially with the militarization of our society and our seemingly perpetual wars in distant lands. Tonight, you'll meet a few of those obsessions. The first piece I'm going to read is the introduction to my new book, The American Way of War, How Bush's Wars Became Obama's. It's called, Is America Hooked on War? War is peace was one of the memorable slogans on the facade of the Ministry of Truth, or Many True, in Newspeak, the language invented by George Orwell in 1948 for his dystopian novel, 1984. Some 60 years later, a quarter century after Orwell's imagined future bit the dust, the phrase is, in a number of ways, eerily applicable to the United States. On September 10, 2009, for instance, a New York Times front page story by Eric Schmidt and David E. Sanger was headlined, Obama is facing doubts in party on Afghanistan, troop build up at issue. It offered a modern version of journalistic newspeak. Doubts, of course, imply dissent. And in fact, just the week before, there had been a major break in Washington's ranks, though not among the Democrats. The conservative columnist George Will wrote a piece offering blunt advice to the Obama administration summed up in its headline, time to get out of Afghanistan. In our age of political and audience fragmentation and polarization, think of this as the Afghan version of, Wal of Vietnam's Walter Cronkite moment. The Times report on those democratic doubts, on the other hand, represented a more typical Washington moment. The focus of the piece was a planned speech by Michigan Senator Carl Levin, chairman of the Armed Services Committee. He was, Schmidt and Sanger reported, hoping to push back against well-placed leaks in the Times, among other places, indicating that War Commander General Stanley McChrystal was urging the president to commit 15,000 to 45,000 more American troops to the Afghan war. Here, according to the two reporters, was the gist of Levin's position about what everyone agreed was a deteriorating U.S. position. Quote, he was against sending more American combat troops to Afghanistan until the United States speeded up the training and equipping of more Afghan security forces. Think of this as the line in the sand within the Democratic Party. Both positions could be summed up with the same word, more. The essence of this debate came down to more of them versus more of us. And keep in mind that more of them, an expanded training program for the Afghan National Army, actually meant more of us in the form of extra trainers and advisors. In other words, however contentious the disputes in Washington, however dismally the public viewed the war, however much the president's war coalition might threaten to crack open, the only choices were between more and more. Wow. Uh <laughs> I'm, I'm seldom at a loss for words, but I was, I was just sitting there with Patrick and both of us were just kind of shaking our head in amazement. I mean, it's uh, incredibly powerful, Tom, what you've done. You. It's really, I mean, it's uh, in this era of Twitter and iPhones and SMS texting, just to, to sit for you know, 45 minutes or so and listen to the work of someone who clearly has spent a lifetime thinking about these issues and struggling with them is, it really puts to shame a lot of the people masquerading as journalists and historians these days. Historians these days. You know, Tom, was, you were talking about the, uh, the, the think tankers, and I always think, you know, now when I look at those people, I always think of, of what my good friend Naomi Klein says, that they're 
people paid to think by the makers of tanks. <laughs> yes, and, 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 and in this case, literally, um, think tankers now are hired by the, I mean, David Petraeus, General David Petraeus, the, our, our Afghan war commander and as CENTCOM commander, he hires these guys, they go out, they do studies for them, they, they take tours, they get all this special stuff, and then they come back and go into the think tanks and the media goes to them, and then they just talk as objective uh, right. people talking about the very situation they've been working for the US military. In, in fact, you know, well, you know, people call Petraeus a uh, Cheney's general, um, you know, which is really incredible yeah, now yeah, that you know, Obama, right. Obama has really taken a number of the, uh, of, of the most sort of vile characters from the Bush administration and, and actually continues to rely on them to one extent or another. I mean, you know, Secretary of Defense Gates was basically Gates, a gun runner absolutely. during the uh, uh, yeah. The Soviet war in Afghanistan, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a major and, league spook. And, and by the way, he wrote a classic memo about the uh, Soviet Union as it was going down saying it wouldn't fall. Right. <laughs> Trust us, we're experts. Yeah. yeah. You know. uh, I, I, uh, I, I was recently interviewing a, uh, uh, an army colonel who was forced into retirement early on uh, during the uh, Iraq invasion under the Bush administration because he he didn't go along with the sort of neocon version of, of events and, and, and uh, his war planning suggestions, which were uh, much more closely in line with General Jay Garner, who wanted a, a, yeah. a, a much swifter in and out for the United States and to actually work with uh, the Iraqi military rather than to disband it, thus creating a quarter of a million enemies. Um, but he also went to West Point with General Petraeus and he told me that General Petraeus has been bragging um, around town how much money he's gonna make when he leaves the military and goes into the private sector. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's not even a revolving door, it's like a bridge. People just walk back and forth between mercenary companies, government, government mercenary companies. And we know from one of your favorite generals, uh, Stanley McChrystal, who was, uh, who headed We're up. thick as thieves, yeah, me and Stan. Who, who, who headed up the, uh, the hunter killer teams in, uh, in, in Iraq. When he finally got axed by the president, he's now out on the uh, lecture circuit getting 35 to 60,000 bucks for, for giving uh, lectures on leadership. Right, exactly, and, and, and of course is at Yale. And, and there's yeah. something I think yeah. that sort of is, is, is just painfully and bloody perfect about the fact that he's ended up in an Ivy League yeah. school. Yeah. You know?